Now this is just heaven on a plate. Here we have two different kinds of chicken enchiladas. I have a chicken enchiladas verde, which is strictly a Mexican version. I have chicken enchiladas with a sour cream sauce, and that is very much Tex-Mex, okay? Side by side, same basic recipe, with one final twist on this one at the end, just to set it off for a bit of Tex-Mex cooking. So, very beautiful dish, very elegant, it looks lovely, something that you would want to serve your guests. I'll tell you what, give this dish a try and you're going to find something very wonderful tasting inside. Hello! Welcome back to Texas Cooking Today. On this episode of Texas Cooking Today, I'm going to fix up something that is very tasty, very popular, exceptional. This is chicken enchiladas verde. Okay, now you've heard of sour cream chicken enchiladas, of course a lot of people have, that's very Tex-Mex. I'm going to show you a way to take sour cream enchiladas and turn them into something special, but also we're going to do a very authentic Mexican enchilada, which is the chicken enchilada verde, and that's with a verde sauce. And we're going to have some wonderful ingredients, I've got it all laid out here, come a little closer and let's go over everything that we need. Now, for this wonderful tasting chicken enchilada dinner, we need some chicken. In this case, I'm going to be using a Cornish chicken. These little game chickens are wonderful. If you would like, uh, if you're going to be cooking for more than two people, you might want to get two of these. Or also, you could use a regular chicken for this, roasting chicken. I like the delicate, tender flavor of these. Now, on our other ingredients down here, let's take a close look. I've got some tomatillos over here on the left. These tomatillos, you're going to want anywhere from about a pound and a half to two pound of those. And, uh, of course, you know, you can just weigh these out at the stores you're buying them. Your poblanos, you're going to want a couple of large ones or three of the medium-sized ones. And on those, you want about eight to twelve ounces worth. And on the uh, these jalapenos here, you're going to want anywhere from about 5 to 10 ounces of jalapeno. Two to four cloves of garlic, about four tablespoons of the cilantro, and also a bit of salt to taste. Now on our other ingredients, I've got some wine, paprika, oregano, salt, and I'm going to be using olive oil also in dressing the chicken to make it wonderful to eat. Now, never cook with a wine that you wouldn't drink, so always taste your wine first and enjoy while you're cooking, okay? Now let's move on to trussing up that chicken and we're going to get that boy all fixed for the oven. Now it's time for us to go ahead and get our chicken all fixed up. And the implements that I'm going to be needing here are some olive oil, salt, oregano, and paprika that we've already mentioned. And of course I've also added some cooking gloves. This just makes cleanup a little easier. You can do this barehanded if you wish. And a couple of pieces of string, one that is about a foot long and one that's a little longer, maybe 16 or 18 inches. And what we're going to do is we're going to truss the chicken just a little bit. Now the idea here is if you'll notice the chicken, he's kind of all splayed out. And if I leave him to cook like that, then these wings are going to get really dry. And the uh, drumsticks here, they're going to dry out also. Uh, so it's just not a really good way to cook this. If I could pull all that together into a tight package, it really helps to hold moisture in a whole lot better. All right, now, to do that, what we want to do is to go ahead, and I'm going to start by getting him olive oil. I need first, you know, grab a uh, pair of tongs. I want to do the bottom side of this little guy first. This is his back. Just want to give him a little bit of oil. Don't worry about any oil getting in the pan. That's going to be fine. And what this oil does is it just adds a fatty layer. It helps to protect the chicken from not drying out quite as quick. Remember, you want them to roast. You don't want to turn them into jerky. Okay. Let's turn him back over. Oops, got his wing caught. Good liberal coating all the way over. Good. 
Now, again, starting on the back side, turn them over again. And a bit of salt. Some oregano. And in this case, usually I'll measure out my ingredients. But in this case, I just want a liberal sprinkling, so it's a little easier. And the same thing with my paprika. I'm not afraid to use plenty of this. I'm going to make a wonderful tasting chicken. There we go. Salt again. Now, some people like to stuff these and they use a variety of other herbs. There's many ways of roasting a chicken. But for this particular dish, I'm going to do, keep it on the simple side and we're going to stick to some common seasonings and flavors of both Texas and of Mexico. This dish celebrates both. After all, a lot of Texas culture, a lot of our heritage, goes right back to Mexico. So we can't deny it. And if we do, then we're just fools. All right, now, Let's go ahead and get this little chicken all trussed up. Let's put our gloves on. And the reason I like to use gloves at the end, it just makes the cleanup a lot quicker. All I have to do is pull these off, and I'm straight on to my next task. First thing I need to do is to deal with those wings. That's the hardest part in my book. The drumsticks are quite easy. Now on these wings, I want to slip this right under here. And I want to slip it around this wing. Pull these back, tie them just like so. You see how it pulls those wings down under his backside? And what that's going to do is it's going to allow the juices from this dish to drip right down into uh, those wings and it's going to keep them moist. Not to mention, it's going to add a lot of flavor to them. As if they didn't have enough already. I'm going to cut off that excess string, toss it aside. Now, right down here, my drumsticks. These are simple. To do drumsticks, you can pull them together like this and tie them. That slips loose on some people. So do yourself a favor and tie, just a simple tie, one time around one leg, just like so. And bring it to the other leg. And we'll repeat that process. I don't have to go all the way around the leg. So he wants to slip loose. There we go. Tighten that down. Give it one more loop. It's a simple. Cut it. There we go. Get rid of my excess string. Now, what do I do with these wings the way they're sticking up? We'll take that tip and tuck him right underneath, and this tip and tuck it right underneath. Okay? There. This is the proper way to truss a chicken, whether it's a little Cornish chicken like this or whether it's a large chicken. It's pretty much the same thing either way. And this helps to hold in juices, it helps to cook more even, and the flavors are improved just by doing this one little task. Now, let's move on to putting this in our oven. That's 375 for about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, depending on the size of the uh, hen that you have. It's time for us to drop our chicken in the oven, but before we do, we want to fix our pan so that it can produce a good quality gravy. Now, the reason I want this gravy is actually to rehydrate my chicken. First thing I want to do is pour in some of that wine, and I've poured in right there about three quarters of a cup. Now, inexpensive wine, but it tastes all right. I want to increase the volume of liquid in the bottom by about one cup. And don't worry, most of this is going to evaporate. It's going to cook out, and you may have to actually put a little more in there. So this is ready to go in the oven. Let it cook. Now, where's that wine glass? It's time for us to process our vegetables. Now, on some of these, there's not much to do, like the poblanos and the jalapenos. We're not going to do anything other than throw them into the water. And the same thing on this garlic, we're just going to take our cloves, remove the paper, throw that in the water. 
The tomatillos need a little bit of processing. They need the paper on the outside of them removed. Now some tomatillos, when you get those, they'll open up easily, just like this. And that paper just plugs right off of the top, okay? Now it's sticky, all right? And this is just the sap that's on it. I'm gonna put that in a bowl because I'm gonna wash all of these. Sometimes you'll get one like this and the paper is kind of stuck to it by that sap. And if that's the case and it doesn't want to peel loose, then you can just take it and put it under water. And when you do that, then that skin will come loose for you, okay? Excuse me, not the skin, the paper husk. The skin is underneath it. Now these things look remarkably like a tomato, okay? And they're often confused by uh, for tomatoes. And uh, they are related, however, it's not the same thing, okay? This is sweet and tangy, and uh, it has a very, uh, um, very unique flavor to it. It also, the inside of it has a, a whole different structure to it and the seeds are remarkably small. There's a lot of them, they run all the way through it and it's, you can't even strain the seeds out. Just little white specks. So, what I'm gonna do is peel back every single one of these. Then I'm gonna take them over and we're gonna get them washed up. As I mentioned, sometimes you get one this has got a real thin skin on it, and it's all stuck in a real severe way. So what I'm going to do is just go ahead and remove what I can, and the rest is going to get washed off. There we go. That one's really, it's really on there tight. There we go. It came off. Okay, I'm gonna wash these now. Now, to get all of this cooked up, you're gonna need a large pot of boiling water. So I have a large stock pot here. I'm bringing it up, uh, it's about half full of hot water, and I'm gonna be bringing that up to a boil. We're gonna boil all of these items in that water. Now, let's go ahead and give these tomatillos a good wash. While you have them under warm, running water, give them a good rub. And you can tell when you're getting it off because at first they feel just sort of slick and then they start taking on a regular kind of a squeaky feel to them like this squeaky clean. So I'm washing out a milky looking liquid and that milky liquid is actually that sap on the outside of it. This is one. Now if you have a colander, that works well for this. You don't have to have it. A nice bowl does the job well. There we go. Now we've got those good and clean. And they're going to be ready to go into the boil now. Now in getting our other ingredients ready to go in the pot, of course we just needed some of the garlic. And I'm going to simply push down in the top and break open that garlic. There. It looks like I pulled out the very four cloves that I needed. I give them a squeeze and a bit of a twist, and that paper comes right off of that clove. The 
cracking sound you hear isn't the meat underneath it, but rather just the paper. And you don't want to twist it so hard that you break it. You'll feel it flex a little. There we go. This way I have whole cloves that I can just throw into the water and boil just like that. Okay? Makes it very convenient. Our next item, we have the onion. Now, when we're dealing with an onion, certain things that you need to know about an onion and cutting into it. Of course, your stalk, and this is the root end. Now, if I cut into the root end, the fibers come together in a small way right here, and most of the liquid in this onion kind of centers itself right around the base here. So if I go cutting into this, then I'm going to have a problem with this thing immediately weeping juices. Those juices are going to release a sulfuric fume, and that sulfuric fume is going to make your eyes water, okay? So I'm going to avoid cutting into that. What I will do in order to remove this outer layer and to start the cut is I'm just going to take the top end off of it. I'm going to gently cut in a circle from here over to there, and I'm going to pull out this outer layer. There we go. Now, I have my onion opened up. The portion I need to use is exposed. To cut down on how much I'm going to be uh, releasing that sulfuric fume, I want to break this into two halves to cook it. Now I can cut this and split it in half, and it's not going to be a major issue. There we go. I didn't do that until the last part, so it doesn't give me problems cutting into it. All right, we have our ingredients all set up, ready to go into our water. It is just now beginning to want to come to a boil. It's not quite there yet. Getting a little steam off of it, and as soon as it breaks a boil, all of this stuff goes into it. Okay, it's time to put our goodies in the water. Now, so you will know, the items that are going to take the longest to cook are going to be the chilies. And then the next longest would be the garlic and the onion. And that onion's going to come apart in the boil. Don't worry about that. And then our tomatillos. And what we're going to do is just keep cooking until everything is nice and soft. Now the tomatillos are going to take, on average, about 10 to 12 minutes to soften up. And you're going to know that they're ready because they're going to split open and they'll feel really punky and soft, okay? So, real easy to know when those guys are ready. I've had my boil going on now for about 10 minutes. So what I want to do is to go ahead and open this up. And we're going to check those tomatillos. Pull this guy over to one side. And you're going to notice that these tomatillos have become very soft and punky. Any of them that are like that, go ahead and pull them on out. It's real soft. That couldn't be in there a little bit longer. This one has started to split open. And that's real common. This one is splitting open. The garlic I want to leave in there. The little one there has split open and that one's punky. soft. So as I say, these uh, tomatillos, they cook up pretty quick. Soft and soft. And they're boiling hot too. They're going to keep cooking just a little bit when we put them aside. Let's see how that one's doing. Ooh, he's soft. It's a matter of moments, sometimes. Now, for the rest of this, we're going to give it 10 more minutes. It's looking beautiful. Well, it has been the end of another 10 minutes. A total of 20 minutes all together on these vegetables right here. I've just shut off the heat. 
Now what I'm going to do is pull these out, put them in the same bowl. Then I put uh, my tomatillos in. There we are. I get a little of this water in it. It doesn't matter because we're going to be boiling them down late in uh, as a sauce anyway, and it's going to have to be reduced. Now, if you're going to be making like Spanish rice or anything like that to go with your meal, you might want to consider using this water right here to make your Spanish rice with. It is packed full of nutrients and flavor. It's a good choice. So, definitely something you don't want to throw away in the kitchen when you've made a stock water like that. Hang on to it because this is flavor for something else. It's time for us to check our chicken. It has been in here for a little over an hour. In fact, it's been about an hour and 10 minutes. And I did have to put in some extra water. I added about 3 quarters of a cup. Now, we need to check the temperature on this little guy to make sure it's absolutely where it needs to be. I'll tell you what, come up a little bit closer. Let's take a good look at this, all right? Now, whenever we're cooking poultry like this, it is always wise for you to have some form of cooking thermometer. And that's what these little guys are good for, is making sure that life is safe. Now, if I want to check the temperature on a bird like this, uh, that has been trussed this way, I want to check the temperature of the meat right in here because that's the densest area right here. And the center of that should tell me everything I need to know. Okay? Let me go right in there. I am at 173.8, which is perfect. Okay? This chicken is done. All I need to do now is to let it rest. And then we're going to shred it and put it down in these juices in the bottom and create something incredible. It's now time for us to make that wonderful sauce. I have here all of our vegetables, and they've kind of cooled down a bit. And back here, I'm going to be using what's referred to as a food mill. Now, so you'll know, one way that you can do these vegetables is you can take these and simply remove the stems from the chilies and toss all of this down into a, uh, a food processor or a blender and just turn it smooth, okay? After that, you're very, very wise if you will go ahead and take a strainer such as this and run all of that material through it so that you can catch the larger seeds of the chilies as well as getting the skins caught. Otherwise, you're going to end up with skins and all kinds of other stuff down in your uh, uh, salsa, and it's not very pleasant. The beautiful thing about about a food mill, it does all of that for you. Basically, you have a large funnel on a food mill with a handle and often some feet of some form, so it'll hang on bowls or uh, on pots or whatever. And then, in the bottom, there are different strainers that go in there. This is great for doing a mashed potatoes. In fact, no better mashed potato can be made except you know, with a ricer. And then, uh, of course, a medium strainer, and then I've got a real fine one here. It's a fine sieve, and this is what we're going to use to make this. And even though this is fine sieve, which is every bit as fine as the mesh that you saw on that strainer a moment ago, it's still fine enough to take care of the uh, seeds from the tomatillo. They will go right through it. Now, let's place our paddle in here. And when you're hooking up a paddle on one of these, a couple things you want to know. The paddle has, has a, a metal side and then just an open side on it. And you want the open side to be close to where you're going to put the second uh, retaining clip. Now you have these retaining clips here on your crossbar. Take your crossbar, hook it to one, depress that spring and pull this over and hook it to the other. And it slides in there real easy. From here all I have to do is just to throw my ingredients in here and crank this a little bit and it's going to produce everything I need. These things are inexpensive too. You can get most of them for under a uh, hundred dollars. Some of them for as low, I have seen for as low as, uh, oh, about, what am I trying to say here, about $35, $40. Now, on our poblanos, I'm going ahead and I'm removing all of the uh, crowns and the seeds on these. And that way, I just have a nice open poblano here. But I need a bowl to throw this stuff in, so let me hook up myself with one of those.
Usually I'm better prepared, but sometimes, hey, it happens, you know? Now on these, I'm just gonna tear them down a little bit. You don't have to tear them down a lot, but break it down a little bit. You don't have to worry about that skin or any of that because that food mill is gonna automatically separate it for you. Now, remember I told you about that seed and the crown? There's the crowns, the seeds, and whatever seeds get down in this, on these larger chili seeds and don't sweat, the food mill will not allow that to pass through. I wanna go ahead and get my garlic in there. There's another one in there somewhere, but I'm not going to lose my mind to try to find it. Now these onions, I'm just going to break them apart a little bit. Don't overwork this. Don't make it too much of a chore. These onions are soft, so they're going to press right down through that. And these wonderful jalapenos. Tear that apart. Pull that in the seed pod and the crown. There we go. Put that in my disposal bowl. Well, that's a juicy, thick, wonderful looking jalapenos. Those are kind of warm too. Now I'm gonna rinse my hands for just a quick second. Now, when you're using a food mill, and I wanna change the camera angle just a little bit here so you can see this better. Uh, when you're using a food mill, you need to keep it up close to you. Let's switch angles here. Now, I'm using my food mill. I want to take the handle on the food mill, not the pot. And you can also hang these on bowls too. I would be careful about hanging one of this type from ceramic. You may break it. Just give this a little crank. I'll tell you, the smell of these chilies is absolutely wonderful. And you combine that chili flavor with tomatillos, which are sweet and tart. It turns this into a heavenly dish. Now when you're milling, you're going to occasionally need to take a spatula and just push the material down. And this does not take a lot of time, a lot of work. What this is doing for me is it is yielding a huge amount of paste. It may not look like I've done a lot, however, I've right now got in the bottom of this pot a about, oh, about a cup and a half of beautiful green sauce, and under here, easily another quarter cup or more of the green paste right off of those chilies. So yes, my mill is doing a great deal for me. And look in the top here. I've got mostly just skins up in here and some seeds, and there's still some pulp left on some of that, and that's going to get worked through also. However, I can go ahead and start putting in these tomatillos. And just drop those guys right down in there. A little more onion. And I'm not going to worry about the stems or anything else on those tomatillos. I'm just going to take them and start grinding them. This spit at me a little bit. Watch out, they'll do that sometimes. There we go. Give myself a little wipe here. <laughs> I like it when cooking gets big. Right up close to me. Very 
simple. Now let's get you a little more close up on this uh, mill so you can look right down in it and see the action that's happening here. As you can see it's sort of a pasty slurry of uh, my stems, seeds, and a little bit of the uh, paste or the center of my vegetables. And of course the fruit, the tomatillo. Now, how much have we produced? Oh goodness, look at all that. So we got a lot of sauce here. And look at the bottom of my mill. It's just packed full. Beautiful sauce. Now I'm gonna put the rest of those tomatillos in here. Oops, there we go. Just wasn't doing it right. There's the other piece of garlic. I found him. A little bit of that onion that's left. Isn't this a wonderful device? There you go, spitting again. Now, if you break that tomatillo, you can split it up in a little bit, it'll prevent it from doing that. And by the way, you can do tomato sauces this way. If you want the perfect spaghetti sauce, the perfect spaghetti sauce, this is the way to get it. You put your tomatoes through one of these. You have no seeds, you have no skins. Only a perfect pulp. Now we're getting to the point where it's pushing it all up on the side. And that's a good sign. When it's pushing it up on the side, that means the material that it's working with is getting very dry. And it's not wanting to hook and hang into the, uh, the sieve below. You notice I just keep working it under. It'll push it out again and that's fine. almost to the point now where I'm ready to say, okay, my food mill has done what I wanted it to do. It's abstracted all of the material I'm interested in removing. If I wanted to stand here and mill this down, I could turn this into just a set of dry seeds and skins. But at this point, I'm pretty much where I need this to be. So I'm just gonna scrape the bottom. There we go beautiful paste. So we have chili and tomatillo paste here and a beautiful sauce down in this bowl. Excuse me in the pan here. And I want to take this and we're going to boil it up but I have to add also some cilantro to this if you remember. And in addition I'm going to put some salt in it and we're going to also add some extra acid to it in the form of lime juice. And you may be thinking, my goodness, it's already acidic enough. However, the lime juice will really bring out other flavors that'll make this whole thing sparkle. I'll tell you what, why don't you try this? Okay, let's get some heat under it. I want a medium high flame. I'm gonna bring this to a boil and we're gonna add our other ingredients. That's why I'm waiting for my green sauce to come to a boil. I wanna go ahead and take my cilantro. And this is a, a, a neat technique that you need to learn if you're gonna be cooking in the kitchen much. Uh, and this is called a chiffonade. And what I wanna do is just kinda of look through this and pull out any stems or stalks that I find kind of unworthy for cooking and or get them aligned where I need them. And I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna fold it just slightly. On just the upper green part, you can see on cilantro down here, there's mostly stalk and then the leaves start a little bit and then right about halfway up they get really thick and I want to take it about three quarters of the way up and fold it back and over and I want to gather those leaves together see how I'm just rolling it a little bit and gathering and rolling and what this allows me to do is to hold them all together curve my fingers under and I want to 
crab motion when I cut this. I'm going to move my fingers back like this as I go, just slowly little crab motions like that. And it allows me to hold this together while at the same time I keep my fingertips turned under and allows the blade to ride against the side of my finger there. And I can just get a simple chopping motion going. Keep that thumb behind the fingers at all times. Okay, mostly stem, a little bit of leaves, not a problem. Any thick pieces of stem I want to go ahead and remove. The small pieces of stem I want. Now, once I finish that with a rocking motion, I'm going to go back through my leaves just to reduce them down a little bit to small particles. I don't want stringy leaves. In my sauce. The larger ones I'm going to gather to the side. There we go. Now, I have a good four tablespoons, which would be, you know, remember three tablespoons is a quarter of a cup, so you're looking for uh, close to a third of a cup on the cilantro. Now, I'm going to take this and toss it right down into my pot. My sauce has come up to a boil. I'll tell you what, let's move the camera over so you can see what's happening here. Now here we are. Check our green sauce. It's gotten a little foamy. It's definitely boiling. Let's start putting in that cilantro. Cilantro provides a wonderful flavor to this. And without it, this dish is really kind of um, devoid. Now, I'm going to go ahead at this point. We're going to add in that lime juice. And I'm going to put in some salt. And I want to put in about a half to three quarters of a teaspoon of salt, just to start with. And then we're going to taste it and see if I need to adjust that seasoning off of there. But this first needs to boil. And I'm going to let it boil for about 15 minutes. And then I'm going to remove the cover. And we're going to let it reduce after that. And that's going to take about another 15 minutes. About a total 30 minute cook time is what's usual on these. If they're really watery, it could take a little longer. There we go. Now, it's just a matter of time. I'm going to reduce my temperature to a low, and that way it simmers. Now, our chicken has had plenty of time to rest. So what I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead and pull it out of this pan, set it on our cutting board. Now if you'll notice, I'm setting this on a brown cutting board. If you're using a plastic cutting board color-coded system, remember, brown cutting boards are for all cooked meats, regardless of what category, whether it's fish, red meat, or poultry. If it's cooked, it hits the brown board. If it is raw, it will hit one of the other colored boards. For instance, poultry, when it's raw, it's the yellow board. But never put it on a yellow board after it's cooked. You see, when you go to a fast food restaurant, that'll give you something to look for, won't it? You can look back behind the line and see if they're cutting their meats on an appropriate board. And I'm absolutely sure that they will just love and adore you for doing that. Now, so you will know how we can section down a chicken. This is very simple. I'm going to pull the parts apart. And I want all of this chicken. I want everything that is meat or skin. See how I break that leg back, pull the joint loose, and then just cut down through it, OK? So there I have my legs with the uh, part of the back there. That nice, and then that wing, which stayed nice and tucked. I want to unhinge him at the top and bring my knife straight off through it. Isn't that beautiful? Take him again, pull him up so that it unhinges right down here, and then take your knife right back through it like so. 
Now, I'm going to pull this skin off so you can see this breast a little bit easier. And we're going to chop up that skin, as I mentioned. We're going to use it. Normally, I'd want to keep it on the breast lot and just cut right through it. But what I wanted to show you, all chickens at the neck here have a little bone that runs right through here. We call that the wishbone, okay? So if you don't want to cut through a wishbone, cut it from the butt side down here. There is cartilage that runs up the middle. And if I want to do a nice pretty job of this, just to the side of that cartilage, I will run my knife. And when I feel it hit firm area, I curve the knife outward slightly, okay? Pulling a little, and there is our breast. Now, the other way, and since you're just going to be shredding this, so you'll know, I want to show you how to dissect the chicken. Just push your finger underneath that meat and pull it loose from the carcass, all right? And we're going to do that all the way around all of this meat and skin on the back, every bit of it, I want it. Normally, you would be using a regular chicken to make uh, enchiladas like this. However, these little things, they're so tender, so flavorful. Now there's that wishbone right there, okay? I broke him. But that, there it is. You see how we've worked all of that meat off around it? If you cut it from the back, you'll do that. Otherwise, you're going to have that bone in your meat to contend with if you cut it from the head end up here, okay? Little tip for you there. Now, the carcass here, I can simply remove it. These pieces of meat that are still whole, I'm going to set to the side, but that which is already shredded and starting to pull apart, I'm just going to go ahead and help it along a little bit. We're going to push it off to the side here, because that's ready to go in into enchiladas. Now that skin, set it aside to be cut together. When you're cutting your breast to get tender pieces, put them together, cross cut them. It will break down easily. They'll shred. And what that's going to do is it's going to help it absorb the moisture that it's going to be put down in just a minute. This is the driest part of the meat. That's my beeper telling me green sauce is ready. So I'm going to check that. Let's look to the side here. Let's grab and kill our beeper. Let's give this a stir. It's looking beautiful. Like I said, I wanted to boil it, so we'd rather simmer it low. Then I was going to open it. See how it's still right in. So we're going to cook off some of that moisture now. It just needs to sit here and simmer on the stove for a while. I'm going to simmer it open now. Right. Now, that white meat, I'm going to push it to the back there. The rest of this, we're just going to strip it off of the bone. Dispose of the bones as we go. Pull that skin off. Put it aside with the rest of the skin. Taste. Mmm. Oh my goodness, that's just delicious. <laughs> okay. Be careful, there's these small little sliver splinter bones that you're going to find on the wings. You don't want to get that mixed in with your meat, okay? Be careful to remove those, to sift through that meat well. You don't want somebody choking on a little bone like that. Here we are, and one at a time. We work our way through these little pieces, these little tiny wings. The wing, in my view, is the best meat on the chicken. The best of the best. It's delicate, it's light, and it's also become a national sensation. 
thereby jacking up the price of chicken wings. Now as you can see, one of these little birds would produce a nice meal for a single person. Not really enough for two people if you were doing just the bird itself. However, when we're working with tamales, one of these is more than enough to produce three tamales per person and take care of at least a couple of people. Pardon me. Get this back where it should be. This is the joy of doing home videos. Sometimes you get a little mistake in there. As I promise, you get everything. Mistakes, the right part, the wrong part, everything. We go through it together. And of course, in my short version, I get to make myself look like a hero and cut that part of it out. <laughs> Simply just pulling meat off the bone. There we are. Double check it. Any other small bones? Nothing there. Now, our skin. The way I did my chiffonade earlier, I'm going to take the skin make the same thin cuts, same crawling action. More of a slicing action on this rather than a chopping. Got good downward pressure on that. There we go. The skin's chopped up and that's just flavor, pure flavor. Toss that white meat down in the juice first and push the rest of this on top of it. Now, that juice that was down in the bottom becomes a natural hydrant and flavorant for this chicken. We're talking about nothing but pure chicken flavor here. Mm. Oh my goodness, that's delicious. Okay, now let's move on to the next part. Now, I have my chicken in uh, a small oven at warming and still in the same bowl, the same beautiful gravy pulled out of it. Now this, I'm just checking, getting a little build up on the bottom, I'm going to start with it. It's starting to get thick where I want it to, but it's not quite there yet. It's looking very good though. So what I need to do is to taste it see where we're at on this. Hmm. That is wonderful. It's acidic. It's got a slight warmth to it. It's not like real fire and hot or anything. Mm. Right? everything a good green sauce should be right there. Nothing like a salsa verde. Mmm. Nothing like a salsa verde. I need to take a moment to prepare some of the garnish that I'm going to be using. And on this onion, I notice I still have a little bit of skin. There we go. I'll take that off. Now, what I want to do when I'm cutting my onion, as I showed you before, I don't want to interrupt that root end. So I'm going to take the top off again. Make a simple light cut upward. And then this outer piece, you can see why the first part looks nice, but over here it's a little less than nice. And I would rather lose a little bit of good onion than to get anything bad in one of my dishes. So, there we go. 
Now, from here, I want to have just some thin onion slivers that I can use on the side of the root. I'm going to put my knife there. I'm just going to cut down like so. And I'm going to use this part right here. And this part, I'm going to save it back. I can put it in a plastic bag and use it for some other dish. For this, I'm going to turn him around. And when I'm making thin cuts like this, as I showed you before, keep those fingers turned under. So when you're making your cuts, you can just slowly bring your fingers back. And on this, it's slick. So I can just keep them curved under and slowly slide them backward, like so. Put my thumb against the back end so that it doesn't slide backward. See? Now, have it. Some beautiful little onions that I can use to garnish with. Now let's take these, set them in a bowl. Now I'm going to go ahead and break out a couple of other items and we're going to take care of, uh, or uh, take a moment to get those ready. And these are all items that we're going to be using in finishing up and making that uh, dish look beautiful, our garnish. Now, I have my queso fresco. I've cut a little wedge of it. The queso fresco is pretty much like a cross between um, mozzarella and uh, ricotta. It's a Mexican cheese. It's firm and crumbly, sort of the way um, like feta would be. However, it's creamy the way mozzarella is. It's got some wonderful properties to it. And when it comes to topping a Mexican dish, if you want something authentic and wonderful, get you some queso fresco. There we go. Now, just broken that up. Let's give my fingers a quick rinse. There. Now, our cilantro, we're going to treat it just a little bit different. All I'm going to do here is simply pick loose the leaves off of our stems. As you can see cilantro was mostly stem. However, it's got a most remarkable flavor and it makes a beautiful garnish. And it is as Mexican as it gets. It's also very much in vogue in Texas. It's very popular here and uh, it always has been but it has even been growing more lately. Now if it's wilted, I really don't want it. These leaves down here look nice, but that up there looks kind of wilted. I want to toss it. Remember, it's about beauty when it comes to a garnish. You don't want something that looks you know, yeah, so so. You want it to look nice. It's a bit not too healthy looking. There we go. All right. Now our garnish is taken care of. The items we'll be using, of course, are cilantro, cheese, and a little bit of honey. yummy, yummy. Beautiful topping for an enchilada. We're getting close to being ready to make our enchiladas. First thing I want to do is to prepare my uh, tortillas, my corn tortillas, so that they will be hot and soft. And the way to do this, one way, I'm going to put a little water in the bottom of this dish. And you notice I've put a paper towel in there. And I want to take these and in sort of a staggered formation, sort of like a spiral. And that just makes them easier to grab when you're reaching in to grab one out. There we go. Now I'm going to place another paper towel on top. And again, just sprinkle a little bit of water over the top. This is just something for evaporation. 
to provide steam so that these will heat up properly. Another way of doing these, and a little more uh, Mexican way of doing these, would be to heat a skillet with a little oil in it and then drop each of these into that oil one at a time as you're making the enchiladas. You heat it and then put it on the plate, put your meat on it and then roll it and do those one at a time that way. This way I'm going to heat them all together and we're going to use the modern technology of the microwave. This is one of the few times ever that you'll hear me say, hey, use a microwave. Alright, it looks like we have everything made and pretty much all of our ingredients are assembled and ready to be put together into enchiladas. First thing I want is to show you this green sauce that we thickened. Now you see how this has a very even consistency now. It's a little bit smoother and uh, more liquid than uh, guacamole would be, of course, but not thin and watery the way it was earlier. So here we have a beautiful sauce, and this is going to be wonderful on top of these enchiladas. This is one of the best flavors of enchiladas I know of. Now, something I mentioned earlier is you can do a sour cream sauce when it comes to enchiladas. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add some in of my uh, some of my salsa verde to a little sour cream. I'm just going to stir that in. Now, see how it turned nice and white? What I want to do is add just a little bit more. I'm going to add this in small amounts. Stir that. Do that again. And here, what I have. It's a sour cream verde sauce. That's about half and half. I've got about a quarter to a third of a cup of sour cream in this, and about the same on the uh, tomatillo sauce. And what this has produced is a sauce that is absolutely exquisite. If you want a sour cream chicken enchilada, do this right here, and you've got an absolute winner. Let me taste this guy. Mmm. Mmm. Oh, that's delicious. Absolutely sharp with acid, but at the same time creamy. It's got a little bite to it. That is a perfect topping for an enchilada. So we can go either this or the regular verde sauce, either way, on top of these enchiladas. Now, I've gone ahead and pulled the chicken out of the oven, and I was just keeping it in there on a warmer setting. And remember, we put this down in its own juices, so it's plenty moist, okay? However, and it's got that wonderful, wonderful roasted flavor. What I'm going to do, though, I'm going to add a little bit of this salsa verde to it. Not just a whole lot. I only want about two, maybe two and a half tablespoons of salsa. I'm going to mix that into it. And that way we just get a little bit of that flavor inside with the chicken. And now the chicken is ready to go down in our enchiladas. So at this point, it's just a matter of assembling the whole thing. We need a good clean plate. Open up my tortillas. Place some of the chicken on our corn tortilla. Give it a fold and a roll. I'm going to tuck that under as I do, very gently. And don't worry about a little sauce getting around it, because that's going to be all covered up if you all that juice. Don't worry about it. Now, a little more. In Mexico, generally, you want your you want this uh, tortilla to become soft and wet with the sauce and the juices of the meat. And it takes on a very special character when that happens. It shouldn't be dry at all.
There we go. Now, I have those spaced just a little bit. You can just like that. Now on these, because I wanted to go true blue, real Mexican style chicken enchiladas verde. These are going to have strictly a verde sauce across the top of them. And we're going to do, I'll do a separate plate with that sour cream sauce. I just wanted to show you how that was made so that you have a choice. Now, I'm going to overfill a little extra sauce dropping down off the side over there. Same thing across the fronts of these. You don't want the end of the enchilada to be devoid of any sauce. You want it to be completely coated from end to end. I'm going to give that a little shake. I'll bring it down into shape. Beautiful. Now, very gently, I want to coat this with some of our other ingredients, like our sliced onion. I'm going to drop it from above here. Beautiful, real thin sliced onion we had. Next, I want a little cheese. And of course, no dish like this would be complete without a little cilantro sprinkled across the top of it. Give it color, life, zest, and of course the wonderful flavor of cilantro. There we have it. Lovely. Chicken enchiladas burger. Tell you what, this has been a neat experience, hasn't it? Chicken enchiladas verde. I tell you what, these wonderful little gems. Oh, I can't wait to cut into this. I'll tell you what, let me slice one of these open. Let you take a good look here. Now, look right up in there. Meat inside, beautiful. Mm. Mm. Oh, I'll tell you what. When it comes to chicken enchiladas, you're going to be hard pressed, very hard pressed, to find anything better than that. And you found it right here, okay? Give this recipe a try. You're going to be blown away when you do it. Oh, man, I can't wait to dig into the rest of this. My mouth is just watering for it now. <laughs> well, thank you very much for watching Texas Cooking today. And please, subscribe. You have a good day. Thank you for watching Texas Cooking Today, the show where you can get great recipes and the best techniques are taught. Please subscribe to Texas Cooking Today, where you will always find something hot and ready to eat.